Thank you, Brett. Critics within President Biden's own party are now blasting his 2024 campaign strategy. Just as key voter groups seem to be souring on the president, Democrats say it's not enough for him just to focus on former President Trump. Josh Krauschauer is Jewish insider, editor-in-chief, and Fox News radio political analyst. He joins me now. Josh, take a look uh, at this from NBC News. They report today Rep. Maxwell Frost, a Democrat from Florida, is the human embodiment of all the Democratic-leaning constituencies who are souring on President Joe Biden. He's young, progressive, black, and Latino. The 26-year-old freshman believes the president is struggling with voters of his background because they haven't heard a compelling agenda outlining how Biden would improve their lives that would motivate them to elect him to a second term. What, are you... Is what you're seeing squaring with this disenchantment? Yeah, Jillian, that, that's the biggest part of the Biden reelection campaign, which is that essential parts of the Biden coalition that propelled them to victory in 2020 are now defecting from, from the president, a lot, largely over concerns about the economy. So you have younger voters, uh, you know, which Biden won overwhelmingly in 2020, are now leaning towards Donald Trump, if you believe the latest polls. You have Hispanic voters who, again, have been a huge part of the Democratic coalition. If you believe the latest polling, they're, they're pretty evenly split between the two candidates if Trump is the nominee. And also African-American voters, which is an essential part uh, of, of the Democratic base. Uh, Biden won about 90 percent of the black vote in 2020. There was an AP poll out this week showing his, his approval rating with, with black voters only at, at, at 50 percent and only getting about 70 percent support in head-to-head -head matchups. So these, these, this is the Democratic base. These are the folks who need to show up and overwhelmingly support uh, President Biden, and he's losing critical support in these constituencies that he can't afford any, any defections from. There is some messaging that's trying to bridge the gap or narrow the gap, whatever, however you want to describe it. Take a look at this from the campaign manager, Julie Chavez Rodriguez. She says this week, we are treating this election like it will determine the fate of American democracy because it will. The threat Donald Trump posed in 2020 to American democracy has only grown more dire. This comes, Josh, this statement comes as a whole lot of Biden insiders uh, publicly and behind the scenes we're learning are encouraging the campaign to actually focus forward in a different direction. People, their voters, they're saying, are not as interested in relitigating uh, Donald Trump's presidency as they are now, eager to hear Biden's agenda for them looking forward. Do you think that's good advice? Well, look, the Biden campaign is trying to make this race a binary contest. They're, they're assuming Donald Trump is going to be the Republican nominee. They're trying to throw out the, the, the book. They're trying to throw out all the negative oppo against Trump early on and, and hoping that they can win some of these voters back by reminding them that this is a choice between two, two candidates. I think the challenge, Jillian, is that it's it actually there are going to be a lot of other candidates on, on ballots, third-party candidates. Uh, so you have, you know, Jill Stein in the Green Party. You've got Cornell West running for president. You've got Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Uh, so there's a there's a real likelihood that a lot of disaffected voters, especially those young voters, could end up voting for third-party candidates, could defect from Biden, even if they don't support Donald Trump. So I think there's a little bit of overconfidence, a little bit of, um, you know, it sounds like the Biden campaign thinks that, that everything is on track, but even if a lot of their, their own voters don't support Donald Trump, they could stay home or they could support some of these more progressive third-party candidates. There's also the student loan contingent of voters here are new reports this week that as students are now for the first time trying to repay the loans that the president tried to spare them but was overridden by the Supreme Court, they're having these major sort of bureaucratic headaches. They're not able to log onto websites. They're not able to reach human beings on phones. It's causing a lot of angst. Who is, how is that going to sort of pan out in the election? Who are they going to end up blaming for that? Well, the original thinking from the White House is that they would win support from younger voters by uh, forgiving the, the billions of dollars in, in a lot of this student debt. And even if the Supreme Court, as they did, overruled the, the, the legislation, the executive order, that they would blame Republicans, that they would blame the Supreme Court, they wouldn't blame the Biden White House. The problem, Jillian, is that 
competence matters too. And, and a lot of people are, as they're starting to repay their student loans, are seeing a lot of bureaucratic problems. They're getting a lot of, a lot of challenges in figuring out what, what to do and how to handle the, the, the repayments for student debt. And a lot of them are, are, are frustrated and blaming, blaming the White House. They, they thought that they were going to get their, their student debt uh, handled or, or, or relieved, and they're very being, being surprised by the fact that they're you know, in the holiday season, having to deal with these, these you know, bureaucratic incompetencies. So it, it, it's, it's sort of the law of unintended consequences. The Biden campaign thought it was a win-win by trying to appeal to these young voters by, by getting rid of their student debt, and it's turned out to cause them some, some unanticipated headaches. Sounds like folks are not going to give him, you're saying, a whole lot of credit for trying, but then ultimately failing. I want to ask you about this before I let you go. President Trump reportedly pressuring these two Detroit election workers. He called them directly, personally, after the election and told them not to certify the results. Ronna McDaniel from the RNC was apparently also on that call. What kind of fallout would you anticipate seeing from this reporting, if any? It's a reminder of how uh, brazen the former president was in the aftermath of losing the 2020 election. We, we've heard the call with the Georgia Secretary of State that, that caused, that's causing Trump significant legal problems right now. Uh, now we know that, that he's, it wasn't just Georgia, it was Michigan, and he was threatening and, 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 and trying to, to, to arm twist uh, Michigan uh, election workers. So this is another, another legal headache, another political headache for, for, for Trump. And it, it's gonna, I, I think 2024 is going to be a, an issue for Trump more on the legal front than on the, on the, on the political front. Uh, well said. All right, Josh, got to leave it there, but happy holidays to you. Thanks for taking time with us today. I'm Steve Ducey. I'm Brian Kilme. And I'm Ainsley Earhart. And click here to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page to catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis.